Hello and welcome everyone um, to that afternoon session. Uh, I'm glad to be here, really excited to be part of Berlin Buzzwords this year. I'm happy to uh, present today's talk, which is about uh, giving you some ideas how you could um, have something like that would qualify as real end-to-end -end encryption bet between like client applications uh, that talk to Kafka. We're going to use uh, an example in this talk where we build out a stream, uh, streaming data pipeline between sources. We do some stream processing in between and we feed some data to sinks. And along the way, we can we learn how we can uh, bring this idea of uh, real end-to-end -end encryption to these types of applications. My name is Hans-Peter Grasl. As was mentioned, I'm from Austria. I work at Red Hat as a developer advocate. And what I'm presenting today is uh, those ideas around uh, a side project of mine that I started. So it's an open source project that you can also check out later. But before introducing you to that, it makes a lot of sense to take a little step back and uh, just remind ourselves uh, what we typically have when we work on top of Apache Kafka, and I refer to open source Kafka in this case, when it comes to the core security mechanisms. There's essentially three things that we do to protect data when we build applications on top of Kafka, um, and I'll briefly go through all of them. The first is, of course, over the via encryption. Uh, you want to make sure that as data travels between client apps and Kafka in order to produce uh, two topics or consume from topics, Nothing gets eavesdropped over the network. N nobody tampers with the data. And this is what we usually do these days with uh, TLS, um, network encryption, basically. So that's something that we can just tick off. You should always have that, not only between your client apps and Kafka. You have probably very good reasons that the brokers that do some communication between each other also have that activated when they talk to each other. The next thing is that you want to have, you want some sort of authentication. You want to understand who it is that you are talking to. If you uh, think of it from the perspective of a Kafka broker, it wants to know which client that is. Um, conversely, maybe you want to do something like mutual authentication. Maybe also your client wants to make sure that it talks to the proper Kafka cluster and not something else. Um, again, different uh, flavors of how to do that. Maybe mutual authentication could be done, again, using certificates. Uh, maybe you use things, different flavors of SASL to do that, client authentication. Uh, again, you want to have that in almost all cases. And then we, want, we have authorization, the third part, which once we know that, uh, who it is we are talking to, we want to make sure that we can restrict certain operations. We want to make sure that not each client application is allowed to read from every topic or produce to every topic or do other things like, I don't know, delete topics, create new topics and stuff like that. So some kind of permission model and again, ACLs and various concepts, how you can go about that. Um, this is table stakes, so I think it's hopefully fair to say that this is something that we don't want to miss. There is, in my opinion, no excuse not to have any of these three for any serious production workloads that you are running uh, in the wild. But the question remains is those three things, is that sufficient in all cases? And I think you might be able to anticipate the answer to that question, at least my personal answer, which is of course no, otherwise I wouldn't be doing that talk and we could end here, right? So the question is, can we go beyond that? Can we bring an additional layer of security to uh, what we have just seen before? Um, and the reason for that is when we think about it from a threat modeling perspective, um, again, to, to make that, that, that clear, there is one specific gap that is worth uh, highlighting here. On the one hand, we have network encryption for our data. That's one thing. On the other hand, I didn't talk about that yet. We have storage-based encryption, different types, volume encryption, disk encryption, file encryption, things like that. But the question is what's in between the network and the persistence. So, and with in between, I mean what happens with uh, the Kafka brokers that are actually you, like processing our data either when it's produced or consumed from topics. And the answer to that is easy because whatever you send to Kafka, every broker sees every payload basically in, in the clear. Yes, it's just a, a bunch of bytes, but it's still clear text from that perspective. 
Um, and so does any legitimate Kafka client. So when you think about, even if you have all those meshes in place, you cannot do anything about uh, easily about uh, things like um, a data breach or somebody that operates your Kafka cluster for you could always see uh, if they want to uh, any data that you produce to and consume from topics. And this uh, actually means how could we have something like a real end-to-end -end encryption in, in such a case so that client applications can securely um, communicate um, over Kafka topics with one another. And this question basically led uh, to the creation of this open source project that I started about three years ago. It's called Kryptonite for Kafka. And the main idea is that you get client-side field-level cryptography when you use that uh, project. Uh, if that doesn't ring a bell, that's totally fine. The talk uh, will explain, and I will show that to you also in a demo, so that you know what that actually is. Very briefly, with client-side cryptography, I mean that we have explicit payload encryption happening as part of your clients that talk to Kafka, so the encryption only ever happens on the client side, never on the brokers. Um, and we are going to see that for source connectors, sync connectors, and also for stream processing, in this case using uh, Flink um, and Flink SQL uh, specifically. And the reason for that is that, we can, that with Kafka uh, Connect and Flink SQL, we can basically use that encryption uh, uh, capabilities very conveniently without any custom code. Field level means we can precisely control and define which part or parts of the payload should get this extra level of explicit encryption applied. Here we see a very simple JSON snippet. The SSN, the social security number, is deemed to be too sensitive to be sent unencrypted um, as part of the payload. So you want to uh, encrypt that. You end up with um, a JSON payload that contains partially encrypted data. Um, if a client wants to read that, data, uh, it can, but it just doesn't, uh, is, is not able to make sense of the SSN field without access to the secret key material that was used to encrypt that data field in the first place. Um, that's a nice property as well, because some clients might just use the, the, the rest of the payload as is and don't need to care about this whole um, um, uh, encryption at all. Um, how does this work in practice? How could you actually apply this idea? And I first started to implement uh, this as part of Kafka Connect using single message transforms. You probably know a bunch of uh, simple SMTs that Apache Kafka uh, ships with. Uh, you can come up with your custom ones, and this is one such custom SMT that allows you to do this field-level encryption. The way this works is, that you use any Kafka source connector that you have available. You point it to the data source that you want to, cons uh, like to, that you want to capture your data from, to put it into Kafka topics. And then uh, you configure the connector as usual, and you put some additional piece of configuration in there for the single message transform, which takes the responsibility to encrypt some payload fields or payload fields, just one, uh, whatever it is that you configure. So that, again, the broker never gets to see that uh, full payload in uh, the clear. The demo about that first uh, a part of the demo, it has three parts, is to show exactly that, what we just had uh, conceptually on the previous slide. We want to use um, MongoDB as a data source. We apply uh, the Debezium source connector, as you would probably have done already in the past if you worked with Kafka Connect and databases. And then we add uh, this SMT. Uh, what I have here is in my shell, I have a bunch of containers up and running, and I have a script that walks me through that demo. There's a bunch of containers. We are going to see most of them during the demo. The first thing is we try to understand how do the documents look like in our data source, which is MongoDB. They look like that. So this is a personal record. No worries, these are fictional records, fake data. So uh, you should not recognize yourself in any of these <laughs> records, hopefully. Um, except uh, due to coincidence. So we see uh, it's, it's not, a, it, it, I mean, it's, it's not a rather complex structure, but it's also not a hello world thing. It contains arrays, it contains nasty documents. It is a, a useful, I think, um, at, at least useful enough for, for the demo to have some structure to work with. And there is several information that we could say is, is too sensitive uh, for the sake of that example to be sent to Kafka as is when Debezium captures it and puts it into topics. 
Uh, we, see width, uh, uh, we, we see height, weight, we see age, we see uh, email addresses, phone numbers, we see known residences and stuff like that uh, that we want to um, encrypt here. What we do is we, we, we start now a Debezium source connector in the background, and I'm just going to point you to the um, core parts of that configuration, which is just a handful lines of, of um, settings here that we use uh, to describe uh, or to tell the SMD what to do. It should encrypt stuff, uh, it should operate on the value, uh, we have a field configuration telling it to look into the payload and, for instance, here say that the, uh, the subfield in uh, personal age, so that, that age should be uh, encrypted and a bunch of other fields, also that array of addresses should get encrypted and things like that. You get the idea, you can configure that here as part of that field config and for the sake of simplicity, the secret key materials that the client, which in this case is a Kafka Connect worker, needs just resides in uh, the container's file system. In my case, you would, of course, not want to do that. You could have that in a KMS uh, of your choice, or in, not of your choice right now, but at least in, for instance, in Cache Azure Keyboard, which is already implemented um, to uh, basically um, have a way to uh, refer to those keys being stored elsewhere in a safe manner. If we inspect the Kafka records, this is a normal console consumer, this is what you get. You get uh, almost all of those payload fields encrypted, uh, except some where we said it's okay to leave them in plain text. Uh, we see some uh, specifically interesting things. For arrays, for instance, we, we can get uh, all the separate elements in that array encrypted. Uh, conversely, here we had a subfield, remember the phone number and the email, it was basically encrypted as a whole, so we don't even see right here uh, in which subfields would be there and stuff like that. So this is what you get by just applying that SMT, a very flexible way to, to define precisely what part of your payload should get uh, encrypted. With that, let me go back to the slides quickly. The next uh, step of that whole um, you know, idea behind that, that concept was how can you bring similar functionality uh, to further, con uh, further context, so broaden the scope. Uh, st stream processing basically was, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, stream processing was one idea and again uh, it made sense to choose uh, something where people have an easy way to, to actually leverage that functionality and this means uh, in terms of Flink to provide a user-defined function that you can use in the table API but also in Flink SQL. So the way it would work here is that you would create a table in Flink. Uh, in this case you use the Kafka connector from Flink as well so that the table data is actually persisted in a Kafka topic. And then you could start after defining that table, and again we have that SSN number here for the example, you can insert into that table and you could apply some encryption function as a UDF in your SQL uh, statement in this case uh, to encrypt in this case the SSN before it gets written to the Kafka topic. Another Flink job, uh, again Flink SQL that wants to work with that partially encrypted data would define the table structure. Uh, again, uh, using the Kafka connector, and then you could write uh, select queries, for instance, that decrypt certain fields such as the SSN right there to get back the plain text data, maybe do some processing, and if you write something back to Kafka from your Flink job, you can again encrypt, um, uh, re-encrypt or encrypt in a different way, other fields and stuff like that along the way. So, the second part in that demo, and this is the part where it's currently still experimental because that uh, code uh, that I am running right now on my machine is not yet part of the uh, open source GitHub repo. It will be there in a few days, hopefully. Just need some tweaking and polishing and then I will put it there. Um, so uh, here we try to just take the, the, the payloads, so the records from Kafka that were captured from the MongoDB database using the Debezium connector and we do some processing uh, to show how to apply the UDF. Let me do that real quick here. Let me open the, uh, the uh, Flink SQL uh, CLI. Uh, if we show the jars, you see there is a jar file right there which contains that experimental integration for, 
Flink uh, with uh, that Kryptonite project. And this gives me some user-defined functions right here. So user functions, you see that there is different types of uh, decrypt and encrypt functions for arrays, maps, and for uh, primitive data types and things like that. With that available, we can actually um, come up with a table definition here. Uh, that refers to that topic that was captured from that Debesium source connector and is partially encrypted. So we can do that and then we can say select star from, we should see the same uh, or similar output that we have seen from the con sole consumer. So we see that that Flink query and that Flink job now sees partially encrypted data. While we can read the, fir uh, the first name here, uh, right here, the first names, we cannot see uh, last name or, or, or the other stuff that was encrypted at that stage, right? When we apply those uh, now, uh, those uh, encryption or decryption function, and I'm just uh, running one Flink job here, I create a derived table. Let me cr uh, create it and then briefly explain, because it's a slightly more um, uh, involved query, but it's, it's not that hard to understand either. What we do here is, for instance, we see how we can first decrypt the last name, concatenate it with the first name, and then re-encrypt this field to, uh, as a full name into a single field that gets encrypted. Here, for instance, we do some calculations. We calculate things like the body mass index, so the weight category of a person. We need the weight and height of this person, put it in some formula to understand uh, the weight class of a particular person. Um, uh, this is what we uh, uh, can do, and all of those elements that we need for the calculation are, are, have been originally encrypted. We decrypt them here. And the same for addresses we put out of the array. We put out the last known residence, say this is the current residence, and say it's, it's sensitive information, we need to encrypt it. So what happened with that query behind the scenes is that Flink job has done the processing by now. And again, what we see in Kafka is this. We see a, a, an encrypted full name, we see the weight category and the age in plain text, and we hide the current residence, uh, so the address information for that person as well. Um, so to show that we can again use this idea to protect uh, any type of sensitive data when uh, the Flink job would write it back to Kafka. Finally, to make the, just the, the, the home stretch, basically, when you think about bringing encrypted data to some target systems out of Kafka again, um, again, you have sync connectors in place, uh, and you can imagine it's very similar to earlier. We apply the SMT that we have, and we ask it to decrypt certain fields on the way out of Kafka. So if we want to feed uh, those uh, uh, or some of those records that the Flink job just generated to some uh, downstream system. In our case, it will be uh, an S3 bucket right here. We're going to take that uh, to conclude the example. Uh, the MinIO connector from the Apache Camera project uh, apply the SMT, which does the decryption of the data that was encrypted by the Flink job, and we end up uh, in a S3, in this case, MinIO bucket with. Uh, the data being uh, decrypted. Let me just show that to you and then I'm about to finish. Again, similar, just a few lines of additional configuration for your sync connector code and then we can look into the, the buckets right there. Let me see. Here are the buckets, 1508. Let's take one of these just to see that uh, we have some success in writing those. And yes, this was one such record where we now have the plain text data again for the residence and the full name. Um, that basically concludes this uh, streaming data pipeline uh, using uh, connectors and uh, Flink SQL and applying that idea of, of uh, field level encryption. That's, that's the project right there. So if you want to explore it further, uh, the Flink UDF will come very soon. I couldn't show you implementation details. I wasn't able to show you all the configuration options in this short talk, but I hope it gave you an idea that you can use this stuff very conveniently to protect very sensitive data. When you work with Kafka that is operated in any public cloud by any vendor without uh, having to fear a data breach at the vendor side, uh, so long as you are able to protect your secret key material properly, nobody else could ever read that data again. Same holds true for you if you, if you lose one of those keys. Well, 
I think you know that you have a problem in restoring that data somehow. That's it. Thanks so much for listening and coming. Um, Thank you. Um, and if we have time for questions, I am taking one or two. Otherwise, I am here. You can discuss anything you like about that. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How are the keys managed? Who manages them? Kafka manages them? Who? The keys? No, the key management is done by yourself. In my case, I just had the keys as uh, in, in a file local to the container's file system, okay. which is what you wouldn't do in practice. I mentioned briefly that what you could do is you could put the key material in something like Azure Keyboard. Okay. Uh, in the future, uh, I, I, I could probably integrate with uh, AWS key management system, Google's uh, okay. uh, KMS and stuff like that, but I just have one integration with Azure Keyboard for now, so that you could externalize those secret keys elsewhere. So who implements KMT? The customer? Client? Who implements what? Who Sorry, implements second? KMT? Kafka provides that? Sort no, no, of Kafka it? doesn't do anything in that regard. Just a hook? No, that's all happening in the applications on the client side. Just okay. uh, in this case, this happens with the library and the wrappers on top of it that I wrote uh, using the um, SMT functionality and the UDF. So all of I that see. key management is 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 done by the core library of that project as well. Kafka okay. has no idea about any of this. Okay. It works with any Kafka. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. I'm not sure who was first. Do you have any idea of like schema management yeah. or a scenario where you can have multiple producers that you know maybe some are encrypting or not encrypting uh, the same type of field on the same topic? Right, um, so one producer is encrypting the field where the one is not, or similarly when they're getting encrypted with different keys. Like, how do you handle that from yeah. the consumer perspective? Yeah, so uh, that's it. so. What what what's definitely not the idea is that you use some producers that encrypt an address and others that don't. This is something that you should not do in the same topic. As simple as that. What happens is, of course, when you looked at the payloads, is that once you start encrypting any, any data type other than string, you change the data type, right? We have seen an integer value for the age in the unencrypted data. In the encrypted data, this becomes a base64 encoded ciphertext, which is string, of type string. So it changes, basically, the way you need to think about your schema, because some fields in encrypted form become or strings, while in decrypted form, they have their original data types again. So that's a bit tricky. That, that's one thing to keep in mind. And the other thing was uh, about managing keys. Uh, what I couldn't show either is that you can uh, say which key you want to use for which field. So you can have different encryption keys for different fields. So you could implement some uh, really interesting things like uh, think about a topic where you have data from, from, or, like from different customers. Then you can have a key per customer. And what this allows you to do is then to say, um, basically do something like crypto, uh, 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 crypto shredding in the context of GDPR. So you could say, even if I have it durable, even if I have it somewhere in, in, on disks in backups, I throw away that specific key of the customer and I can never read that data again. Um, so that's an interesting thing that you could do as well. Um, you could also, you know, there's two fundamentally different encryption algorithms. Uh, one is giving you uh, the standard one, uh, like probabilistic encryption. Even if you encrypt the same text multiple times, you always get different ciphertext. So you cannot see that this is the same plain text information in the ciphertext. Or sometimes you need that when you think about Kafka, when you want to, do not want to break partitioning and you encrypt something from the key. Uh, you need a deterministic ciphertext, and this is also possible if you do that, or if you think about doing an equality match against encrypted data, it needs to be a deterministic ciphertext, otherwise you would not find those values and stuff like that. But there's plenty of things to consider. Um, I'm happy to discuss later because I think we are running out of time here. Uh, let's maybe do a quick last yeah? question, sure, if sure. it's okay. 
Yeah, it's a bit of a duplicate because it was really referring to this encryption changing data type right now, and I was curious about how you would deal with this, maybe even in future releases. So H becoming now a string, which might be a bit surprising for for kind of a consuming system afterwards. No, not really, because the idea is that you uh, so actually you once you start to use uh, enc an encrypted or partially encrypted topic. Uh, your consumer should expect the encrypted schema and not the other one because the other one is not persisted any, anywhere. So even if you think about having something like a schema attached, what gets written is the, because that happens before that, uh, what gets written to a schema registry is the schema of the encrypted or partially encrypted payload and not the schema of the unencrypted payload. Yeah. Uh, after decryption uh, or decrypting the payload, yeah. is, the, is your library aware that it was an integer in the first place? Yes. Or float? Or? Yes. Okay. But again, uh, there are some challenges in the context of, of SQL, for instance, when you think about it. That's why there is uh, something where you ne need to provide some type hints of, for SQL because the SQL engine, the SQL optimizer, wants to understand the type that comes out of the of the decryption operation, and it cannot know that automatically before the decryption happens, but it needs to know that in order to analyze and build the AST and optimize the query plan and stuff like that, and make sure that the types match because it's a type. So like for any typed APIs, it's a bit challenging, but it works with some caveats. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for your presentation. Let's wrap it Thank up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.